Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and for my book, Stunning Digital Photography, I'm here to give you an overview of how to use the Fujifilm X-T1. Now, Stunning Digital Photography is written for photographers using any type of camera, and as a result, I have to give kind of general instructions about how to change modes on your camera, select shutter speed, choose things like aperture priority mode, and I can't give camera specific instructions. So that's what this video is for. These, this is the camera specific instructions. But even if you don't have stunning digital photography yet, you'll find it really useful, especially because the Fujifilm X-T1 is a really challenging camera. Whether you're a beginning or advanced photographer, it's unique in many different ways. So not everything is going to be intuitive about it. But let's get started and we'll talk about maybe the most important thing, which is firmware updates. Both the camera and the lens require firmware updates, and most of you will get a camera that doesn't have the latest firmware updates. Now, because this video will be around for a while, I don't know what the latest firmware updates are, but I would search the internet for X-T1 firmware updates, and then check your camera to see if it has those latest firmware updates. To check your firmware, hold down the display back button here, and then turn your camera on. It'll load for a second, and then display the firmware screen. You can see at this time, the current firmware is version 1.1. It's also displaying the lens firmware, so make sure that both are up to date because Fuji does update them occasionally, and it will make a big difference in the performance of your camera. Now I'll talk about setting up your camera. This involves the physical controls of the camera. First of all, the lens and the camera are separate. It's an interchangeable lens system. So there's a button here that will release the lens. So hold that down and then just give your lens a twist counterclockwise to remove it. This exposes the sensor of the camera, which you don't want to leave exposed for too long. If you do take this off, you want to put a body cap on or replace it with a different lens. So when you go to reattach the lens, just look for that little red mark there and line it up with the red mark on the body mount. So I'll push those two together and then twist it clockwise until it clicks. Now it's safe and secure and it shouldn't be going anywhere. I want to show off a couple of other controls. This particular lens has what they call optical image stabilization, OIS, and you can just see an off and on switch here. This just reduces some of the camera shake if you're taking a longer exposure. You pretty much can always leave that on. The only reason you might turn it off is if you're putting the camera on a tripod and you want to save some batteries, but even then, I don't find any problems using it while it's attached to a tripod, so you can pretty much leave it on and then just forget it. On the right side here, you can expose the SD card. This is the memory card that stores your pictures. The digital version of your film slides right in there and then to eject it, just push it so it pops back out. The battery is located on the bottom. You can pull this slide in here to expose the battery. You have to charge it separately. It does not USB charge. On the right, you will see there is a connection for USB, which you can use to transfer images from your camera directly an HDMI cable, which you can use to monitor the menus or video using an HDMI recorder, or more likely just hook it up to your TV to show off your pictures while you're on vacation if you don't have another way to show your pictures. And at the top there, there's a little slot for a microphone in case you wanted to record with an external recorder. This camera does have a built-in microphone, but the sound isn't going to be great. An external microphone will always sound better. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a headphone jack, so you can't necessarily listen to it while it's recording. On the front here below the X-T1 logo is the PC Sync cable. This is a very, very old standard. We're talking like a hundred year old standard hookup to studio lighting or flashes, and you can still use it. It's compatible with all those systems, um, but it's also extremely unreliable, and I hate to use it in the studio because it will just fall out <laughs> at times, and you'll miss your shot, and there involves lots of tweaking. You're, you're better off using the flash hot sync up here at the top to access the flash, just slide the cover off and then slide in the flash here. Also note that the screen is articulating, so you can tilt it up so that you can hold your camera low and look down on it if you're taking pictures of something low to the ground like a flower, or if you're taking pictures over your head, you can tilt it back a little bit. It doesn't flip completely around for selfies nor tilt out to the side, but it's still pretty useful. Now let's talk about using the viewfinder. By default, when you just pick up the camera and turn it on, the display on the back will turn on and allow you to frame your shot or focus it by depressing the shutter button halfway. You can also hold it up to your eye. And by default, the viewfinder will turn on, showing you that just beautiful display that the X-T1 has. 
If you want to manually switch between the viewfinder modes, there is a button right here next to the viewfinder labeled view mode. You can push this and it will switch between the display in the back to turning off completely and then to showing the information in the viewfinder itself. But for me, I always prefer to have it on automatic. It switches really well and saves a lot of time. Each time you push the view mode button, it will switch between the different modes. You can control what you see on the display by pushing the display button here. Each time I push it, it will switch between a different mode. In this mode, you can see I have an electronic level that helps me keep my camera nice and straight. In this mode, the camera is telling me information about the shot, and I would need to use the viewfinder to see and take the picture. For me, I prefer the standard mode. Taking a picture is really straightforward. Simply push the shutter button halfway until the camera focuses, and then push it the entire way to actually take the picture. If you find that the camera is not autofocusing, check the switch on the front of the camera here, which controls your autofocus mode. The S here stands for single focus mode, C is continuous and will track moving subjects, and M is manual focus. If you're in manual focus mode, you'll have to grab the lens focus ring and focus it manually. We'll talk more about focusing in just a little bit. After you take a picture, you'll certainly want to review it. There's a play button by the viewfinder here. So you can just click that and you'll be able to browse through your different pictures by using the cursor controls here. You can also zoom in by using the control dial on the back. So you can see this zooms in nice and tight and then I can pan up and down to view different parts of the picture. While zoomed in, I can use the control dial on the front of the camera to switch between different pictures. So back to zoom and front to change. While reviewing a picture, I can also press the display button to view more information about the picture. That hides all information and shows just the picture. And this shows me the actual histogram, which is useful. The histogram shows me the brightness of the picture. For more information about the histogram, refer to chapters three and four of Stunning Digital Photography. Now let's talk about using aperture priority on this camera. In the book, I discuss aperture priority frequently because it's a common mode that most cameras support, but the Fujifilm cameras do not have aperture priority mode. They actually have what I consider to be a vastly superior design. Rather than having shutter priority and aperture priority, you control each of the different settings manually or you choose to make them automatic. So you simply don't have to worry about those modes. Unfortunately, in the book, because most people have those modes, that's how I have to address them. When I tell you to use aperture priority mode, here's what you should do. You should set the ISO to automatic. The ISO dial is over here on the left and the A stands for automatic. You might have to push the button in to change the ISO mode. You should also set the shutter to automatic. You have to push the button in to change it sometimes. Once you get into automatic mode, you have to push the button to get out of it. But if you're in any other shutter speed setting, you can just slide it without pushing the button over to automatic. Now to control the aperture, you'll use the ring on the lens. And Fuji lenses have one of two different designs. Lenses with variable f-stops, like this kit lens that came with it, have a ring that does not have aperture markings on it. So you can see it has focal length markings like 18, 23, 35, and 55, but it does not have apertures markings on it like f2.8 or f4. So as I move this dial, it's going to be changing the aperture for me, but I can't see it because the markings aren't on the lens itself. Instead, I'll have to look at the display. So as you can see down here at the bottom, it says f11 right now. And as I move the dial on the ring itself, it's changing to different f-stops. This is exactly like changing the main dial on a camera that does have aperture priority mode. If your lens does not have aperture markings on it, you'll see a little switch here that switches between manually controlling the aperture, this icon, or automatically controlling the aperture. If you have it on automatic mode, you will not be able to change the aperture by moving this dial. So when you're in aperture priority mode, you'll want to make sure that's switched over here. If you have a lens that does have the f-stop markings on it, one of the f-stop markings will be A for automatic. Just make sure you manually select an aperture and you'll be simulating aperture priority mode. Now let's talk about how to simulate shutter priority mode. In shutter priority mode, you control the shutter, but you let the camera decide the aperture and ISO. So as with aperture priority mode, we'll just set the ISO to automatic unless you know that you want a particular ISO. Then we'll also set the aperture to automatic. 
either there'll be an automatic marking on the aperture ring on the lens, or you'll have to move the switch over to A. Now, this gives us complete control over the shutter, and the camera will make other decisions for us. To control the shutter, if you're on automatic, you'll have to push the button in and then twist this. And as you can see, it has physically indicated all of the different possible shutter speeds here. Now, as I move it to 60 here, common shutter speed, that means it'll be shooting at 1 60th of a second. It's a little counterintuitive, but 4,000 seems like a bigger number. It's actually a much smaller number. It means 1 4,000th of a second. So it's always one over the number that you see. And of course, when you get all the way to 1 1, that means that it's one full second, one nice long exposure. There we go. You can see the shutter state open for one second. 1 60th or 1 1 25th is a pretty common shutter speed. Now, most of these are in full stops. If you want to do smaller increments, go ahead and select your shutter speed here and then use the forward dial. So once I started at 1 60th, you can see by moving the forward dial here, I can go to 1 50th, 1 40th, 1 80th, or 1 100th. It just allows you to increment it in one third stop increments. You don't often have to do that, but you might need to fine tune your shutter speed. Now let's talk about how to simulate manual mode on the Fujifilm X-T1. In manual mode on a traditional camera, you have complete control over the aperture and shutter speed, and optional control over the ISO. You can use automatic ISO on many cameras. Of course, the Fujifilm does not have those different modes, so all you're going to do is simply manually set the aperture and shutter speed from the camera itself. So to simulate that, you will move the switch from automatic mode on your lens over to manual control. If your lens has f-stop markings on it, you'll just turn the dial to line up with one of the f-stops. For the shutter speed, you'll use anything except the A there. You'll just manually specify your shutter speed. And again, you'll use the forward dial to make smaller increments that aren't marked on the shutter speed dial. If you want to manually control the ISO, you'll take this left dial here out of automatic mode and switch it over to whatever ISO you want to use. Now we'll talk about using bulb mode. Bulb mode keeps the shutter open indefinitely. Could be for half a second or for 10 seconds, however long you happen to keep your finger on the shutter. The bulb mode is indicated with a B on the shutter speed dial. So I'll go ahead and push this button in since I have to move past automatic and it would lock on automatic. I'll get over to the B here. And now the shutter is going to stay open as long as I have my finger pressed all the way on the shutter. Now it's taking a picture. And you can see it starts counting for me, telling me how long the shutter has been open. This is useful for long exposures. For example, taking pictures at night, doing star trails, etc. As soon as I release the shutter, it's going to stop taking a picture. Now, you wouldn't want to hold your finger on the shutter for two or three minutes that it might take to get some star trails done, right? If nothing else, you would shake the camera a little bit, but frankly, I don't think anybody has that kind of patience nowadays. What you'll probably do instead is you'll use a remote. There is a port here for connecting an external remote, something you'll need to buy from Fuji if you can't find a third party alternative. With those remotes, you'll be able to just lock the shutter open after putting the camera into bulb mode. I kind of addressed it already, but quickly cover how to change ISO. ISO is on this dial here, and if you want your camera to decide the camera's sensitivity, the sensitivity of the sensor, how, how much light it needs to gather to get a properly exposed picture, you can just put this in A, automatic mode. And until you fully understand ISO, that's the best place to leave it. To change the ISO, you'll need to push in the center button here and then twist the dial. ISO 6400 is the highest native ISO. H1 is equivalent to ISO 12800 and H2 is equivalent to ISO 25600. The X-T1 shows the current ISO on the back and the near the bottom right corner. For more information about using ISO, refer to chapter 4 of my book, Stunning Digital Photography. I'll tell you everything you need to know about what ISO means. Now let's talk about controlling the shutter on the Fujifilm X-T1. There are several different shutter modes, and we'll start with single mode. You can see this dial here gives you control over the shutter. S is single mode, which means when I push the shutter down, it takes one picture. If I keep holding it down, it's not going to take more pictures, it just takes the one picture. If you want to shoot continuously, which you might do for sports or portraits or just about anything, it's always good to, good to get a couple of shots, just move this dial to CL or CH. 
CL is continuous slow shooting. CH is continuous fast shooting. Think of it as like low speed and high speed. So here's what low speed sounds like. Let me get a nice fast shutter speed. Hold this down. So you can get a C, you get a couple of frames a second. If I go to CH, it's going to be much faster. Really a very, very fast camera. Now we'll cover different focusing modes on the Fujifilm X-T1. Whereas most cameras have focusing mode dials like manual focus or automatic focus on the lens, on the Fuji it's mounted right here on the body. And you can see this switch here has three modes, M, C, and S. M is manual focus mode. If you're old school and you want to manually focus, maybe you're doing macro photography or landscape photography, you'll switch that to M and then you'll control the focusing on the lens right here. If you want to continuously focus, tracking a moving subject, to put it on C. And then, by default, the camera will automatically focus when the shutter is depressed halfway. So you can see here, it tries to focus on the subject, and then if I get closer, it'll keep trying to focus on that S right there, and it's doing a pretty good job. But you'll notice that in continuous focus mode, it kind of hunts. It's always searching for a moving subject, even if the subject is still. The third mode is S. We'll switch it over to S mode, and that's single focusing mode. And this is what I use most of the time with this camera. With single focus mode, it will search for focus, and once it finds it, it will just lock in. Well, there you can see it's not getting focus, so it's giving me the AF warning. That means I can't autofocus, there's a problem. It's just a warning that it couldn't successfully find focus, but I'll move to something a little contrastier, like this display back here. There you go. I got a green box and a beep, and that means good it was able to find focus. Notice that if I move to a different subject, it doesn't try to refocus as long as I have my finger on the shutter here. In continuous mode, it would be always trying to refocus, but in single mode, it finds it and then stops. Now let's talk about changing the focusing points. With the X-T1, you can focus almost anywhere in the frame. It's one of the best parts of this and other mirrorless cameras. By default, the focusing point in the middle here will be selected. Using the default settings for these function buttons on the back, I can change the focusing point by pushing this down button here. That activates the focus points. Now, these buttons become cursor buttons, moving the focusing point to different parts of the frame. If you wanted to follow the rule of thirds, you might want to put the focusing point up here. Now, in this mode, I can also control the size of the focusing point using the back dial. So, scrolling to the right, it gets bigger. Scrolling to the left, it gets smaller. Now, the smaller size is more precise, and you might want that precision for, say, using a, sh a, a lens with shallow depth of field, like the 56mm f1.2 if you're doing a portrait. You'd want to make it a small cursor and put it right on the subject's eye so that the focus was very, very precise. If you were to use a larger focusing point for that, well, it might focus on their forehead or their nose, and it could ruin the shot. However, with this camera, smaller focusing points are also much slower and less reliable. So there's a trade-off there between precision and reliability. And in general, you want to use the biggest focusing point you can whenever possible. The X-T1 also has face detection mode. To turn that on, I'll hit the Q button here to bring up the quick mode menu, and then scroll down to face detection. With this selected, I can move this back dial here to turn face detection on. Now, if there's a person in the frame, it will lock onto the person's face, hopefully, and try to focus on it. Face detection mode is really useful when you're taking portraits. However, once you turn face detection mode on, you'll find you can no longer move the focusing point around. I'm pushing that back button, and it's not letting me change the focusing point like it should. So you'll have to go in and turn face detection off on a regular basis if you're switching between people and other subjects. Now, with face detection on, it can still autofocus, but it's just going to kind of use that center focusing point and you don't get the option to try to move it around. So generally, unless I'm taking a picture of people, I'll leave face detection turned off. I prefer to always use a single focus point and specify where it should be. The X-T1 also has a more automatic mode where it tries to use logic to figure out where in the frame you should focus. It's a good choice when you hand the camera to somebody else, but for the most part, you should choose your own focusing point. To use the kind of automatic focus detection, hit the Q button and then scroll up to this second selection here. Now, you can see that where it has like a box with arrows around it, that's an individual focusing point. If you use the little plus symbol there, that's the kind of smart Fujifilm thing. So now, if I try to focus it somewhere, it will kind of pick its own focusing point. And you can see, it's, 
picking different spots as I refocus each individual time. Again, I don't tend to prefer that method. It works okay though. Now let's talk about manually focusing your X-T1. Whether you're using a Fuji lens in manual mode or you've adapted a lens and you want to manually focus it since it wouldn't automatically focus an adapted lens, the manual focus tools can be really, really useful. So first, as I mentioned before, you'll just move the switch over to the M and this activates manual focusing mode. It just disables autofocus. So even if you push the shutter halfway, it's not going to try to focus. The X-T1 has several focus assist modes that can help you focus with precision. Just press the focus assist button here on the back and by default it will zoom in. Now, as I try to manually focus, it's much easier for me to find the exact point of focus. There we go. Now, because it's zoomed in way better than my eye could possibly see, I know the manual focus is much sharper than it would be otherwise. You can also select different manual focusing modes. Just by holding down the focus assist button, it will change the mode. So now I have it set to focus peak highlight and what you'll see is that brightness moving through the frame. Let's find a different subject. Let's use the book here. With focus peak highlight enabled, the camera will light up parts of the frame that are currently in focus. So now we see this completely out of focus, but as I get nice and close to it, you can see the cover of the book starts to just kind of glow, right? You can see as I move through the focusing here, you can see the different parts of the frame that are in focus move. Now it's towards the top of the book, and now it's more towards her face. Focus peaking is a terribly helpful tool when manual focusing. Now there is a third focus assist mode called digital split image. And as you can see in the center of the frame here, it has a gray box. And so I'll open up the aperture so it's nice and bright. And as I'm focusing in and out, what we should see <laughs> is two separate images in the middle that move and then line up. Now, there you can kind of see it. It's way out of focus now. And as you look at the gray box, you can see some banding in there. As I start to focus correctly, they'll move closer and closer to each other until they finally line up. I don't find the split image simulation to be that useful. It's simulating the way older film cameras used to operate, but they actually had two separate uh, viewfinders basically that were merged together. And um, anyway, you can play with it, but for me, I either prefer the magnification or the focus peaking. Now let's talk about using flash and flash exposure compensation with the X-T1. The X-T1 doesn't have a built-in flash, but it does come with this nifty FX8 flash. I recommend getting a bigger flash. You'll get better results when you have to use flash. Take out the protective cover in the flash hot shoe here, and then slide the flash right in. Now tilt it back, and you'll be able to use the flash. There are some conditions for using the flash, though. Now uh, I'll try to take a picture of my cameraman Justin here and yeah notice the flash isn't going on even though the flash is in there there are a bunch of things that can prevent the flash from firing the most common is that your shutter mode isn't set to single the flash will only fire when the shutter mode is set to single and unfortunately it doesn't tell you <laughs> any reason why it wouldn't fire so with it set to single it'll probably take a flash now there we go that time it actually worked other things to check are to make sure that macro mode is turned off and that silent mode is also turned off. If you have silent mode on, for some reason the flash doesn't work. Now flash exposure compensation adds more or less flash depending on your preferences. So sometimes you take a flash picture and you look at it and you're like, this is way too much flash, it's all blown out. You can turn the flash down pretty easily. Open the menu, scroll left, now scroll down to camera 4. Scroll right again and then go down to flash compensation. Select this, and now you can dial in how much additional or less flash you'd like. So if it was too bright, you would scroll down to minus one stop or minus two stops. Minus one stop would put out half the light from the flash. Minus two stops would put out one quarter of the light. Select that, and the next picture you take will have that much less flash. You might want to remember to go back and reset this to zero next time. Now, if your flash isn't putting out enough light, that's the time when you'd go in and you'd add one stop that would double the light or add two stops, which would quadruple the light. You can also select from several different flash modes. 
This is a little easier. You can push the Q button here and then scroll down to the flash icon right here. Now, by using the back dial, I can select between rear sync flash, which fires the flash at the end of the exposure. Only really makes a difference on a long exposure. There's information in chapter three of studying digital photography about that. This mode turns the flash off completely, allowing you to leave the flash connected. And this mode has the flash on all the time, whether the camera thinks you need the flash or not. Usually, you can just leave the flash on, and then when you're not using it, put it down. The flash won't fire when you have it pushed down. Now let's talk about the X-T1's different metering modes. Uh, first, I'll remove this flash by just pushing in the button here at the back and sliding it back. The metering modes are controlled by a separate dial on the back here beneath the shutter speed mode dial. So we can see that right now it's in the middle of the three modes, which is the mode I'm going to tell you to use all the time. The one on the left here is spot metering. That meters a very small part of the picture and adjusts the exposure based just on that small part of the picture. That's kind of like the old school film way to do it. But in the film world, we had to be a little more precise and we didn't get the chance to preview our pictures after we took them. So it was more commonly required. The mode over on the right isn't as smart. It just kind of takes the entire scene and weighs it evenly. But this mode in the middle will kind of intelligently assess the scene and look at things like faces and subjects in the foreground and try to balance it as best as possible. For more information about metering modes, of course, refer to chapter four of stunning digital photography. Now let's talk about exposure compensation. Exposure compensation allows you to adjust the brightness or darkness of your picture when you're using any sort of automatic mode, even if it's just one automatic setting like automatic shutter or automatic ISO or automatic aperture. Unless you're completely manual, you might want to use exposure compensation to adjust the brightness. So if a picture ends up being too dark, maybe there's a bright background and your subject's face is in shadow, you can add exposure compensation using the dial over here on the right. So right now it's set to zero. I'm just going to grab it and turn it to one stop of exposure compensation. So first I'll take a picture of Justin here at zero stops. That's the properly exposed picture and it does look pretty good. But imagine I thought it was too dark. I would add a stop of exposure compensation and take the picture again. There's the second picture taken brighter. So this is the before with no exposure compensation, and that's after with exposure compensation. You can see it is quite a bit brighter. The Fujifilm is nice because it will preview the brightness of the display as you adjust it. So as I add in negative three stops, you can see the display gets really dark, and it gives you a good idea of how bright your final picture is going to be. For more precise expectations, hit the display button until you see that histogram there. Now, this little histogram here will move around as I adjust the exposure compensation up or down. You can see it moves left as the picture gets dark, and the histogram moves to the right as the picture gets brighter and brighter. Now let's talk about bracketing with the X-T1. Bracketing takes three different shots at slightly different exposures. One normally exposed shot, one dark shot, and one bright shot. The X-T1 has a dial dedicated to bracketing right here next to the other shutter modes. We'll just grab this and move it over to BKT. Now, when I take pictures, it will take three separate shots. Now, if I play those back, you can see they are all at slightly different brightnesses. The X-T1 only allows bracketing at plus or minus one stop, and that's not something I would normally recommend. You can control the amount of bracketing from the menu. So I'll hit the menu button here, and then scroll over to camera one, the top menu item here, is bracketing advanced setting. So as I scroll down here, you can see I want to use AE bracket. And right now it's set at plus or minus one third of a stop. The bare minimum you'd ever want to use would be plus or minus one stop. So the next time I took pictures, it would take three shots, each at one stop of exposure difference. Now, in the book, Studying Digital Photography, especially in chapter 11, I talk about using bracketing at plus or minus two stops, usually, and often bracketing at five different exposures instead of just three different exposures. You can't do that using software in the X-T1, but you can do it manually. That's actually pretty easy. What I'll usually do is set the aperture manually on the lens. Then I'll set the shutter speed to automatic and 
Maybe set the ISO to something specific like ISO 200. Now the bracketing will work by varying the shutter speed. So I'll set the shutter mode over here to single mode so that it doesn't try to bracket on its own. And then I'll set the exposure compensation dial to zero. Now I'll take a shot at normal exposure. Now I would want a darker shot. So I'll move the exposure compensation mode to negative two. And then I'll take exactly the same shot again. Now I would want that brighter shot. I'll move it all the way up to plus two and take a third shot. Now I essentially have three shots bracketed at two stops each. Because you'll have to kind of move the camera and adjust it using both hands, it, it makes it a little bit harder to bracket. It means that it's going to be difficult to line up the camera. So if you are going to do bracketing or HDR, you might have best results by putting the camera on a tripod. Now let's talk about setting the white balance on the X-T1. White balance controls how cool, blue, or warm, orange your picture is. And the X-T1 fortunately has a great auto white balance setting. And I'm going to tell you just to use auto white balance all the time. But I'm also going to tell you to shoot raw. Raw images keep all of the data captured by the sensor and allows you to adjust the white balance later using software like Lightroom. If you're interested in Lightroom, of course, I have a book, Tony Northrup's Lightroom 5 book for photographers, so check that one out. If you want to manually adjust the white balance, you can push the Q button here to pull up the menu and then go to the upper right corner. Right now you can see it says white balance auto, but I can change that to a variety of different modes. The sun icon here is for an outdoor sunny day. This is for a cloudy day. This is for fluorescent lights in different color temperatures for incandescent lights and of course for underwater photography. Again, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble by setting the wrong white balance and the camera usually makes intelligent decisions. You can also change it later. So white balance auto is almost always the right choice. Now let's move on and talk about using the diopter. If you're a glasses wearer, the diopter allows you to adjust the viewfinder here so that you can take off your glasses when using your camera. I'm wearing contacts right now, but I can't stand to take pictures when I have my glasses on because you know, it holds the camera away from your face a little bit and just makes it kind of hard to see. So I would rather adjust the diopter to my prescription strength so that I can see through the viewfinder without using it. The diopter is this dial over here, and you can just twist it. So what you'll want to do to adjust the diopter, if you wear glasses and don't want to use them while taking pictures, is take your glasses off, put the camera up, autofocus on something, and then with your other finger, adjust the diopter by clicking it until everything looks sharp to your eye. Now the opposite side of this is what happens when the diopter is incorrectly set. Sometimes it can get bumped and what will happen, the symptoms will be you'll be trying to take pictures and everything will be blurry, except when you actually take the pictures and focus. So if you're like, why, why does it look blurry when I look through the viewfinder? It's the, the diopter is at fault. So what, again, you would just repeat that process exa exactly as if you were a glasses wearer. Look through the viewfinder, autofocus, and then adjust the viewfinder diopter until everything is sharp. Now let's go on and talk about recording video. The X-T1 can record HD 1080p video at 60 frames a second, making it a pretty capable video camera. Focusing can be a little difficult, but overall, it's a good video camera to have when you need it. All you really need to do to activate video is to hit the record button here. It's not the easiest button to push. It's actually really hard to get to, but when you push this button, it will start to record. Hopefully, there we go. So now we can see it's recording. You can see it doesn't like to autofocus really. It's not especially good. I always recommend instead using manual focus while you're recording video. I find it just works more reliably when you do need to change modes. When you're ready to stop recording, just push the record button again. You can control the recording quality by pushing the menu button and then going to the camera four icon on the left. You can see the last setting here is movie setup. So as I select that, gives me a couple of different options. The movie mode allows me to choose between 60 frames a second, 30 frames a second, or dropping down to 720p, which is the lower resolution that would take up less space and have less sharpness to it. Pushing the back button here brings me back a menu. And here I can adjust the microphone levels, which are usually best left at automatic. Or 
I can control whether the port back here is used for an external microphone or a remote shutter release. You can manually set that between these two options here. It won't automatically figure it out. So if you do, if you switch between using a remote and a microphone, you'll need to go in and change that. Now let's talk about formatting the memory card. I like to format the memory card every time I unload pictures from my camera so that my memory card doesn't accidentally fill up. You can format the memory card by hitting the menu button here and then going over to the settings menus. You can see the very last option on, on the settings three menu is format. So I'll scroll to the right here and it will warn me this will erase all your data. Pretty scary, right? Better make sure you've unloaded that. Now I'll click OK and it will begin the formatting process. If you accidentally format your memory card, hope isn't lost. Look up a tool called PhotoRec on the web and you can use that tool to recover your pictures. Now I'll show you how to set up the X-T1 to shoot raw images. The X-T1 can capture either JPEG pictures or raw pictures. JPEG pictures are useful for sharing on the web. They're highly compressed and when you take them, you don't have to do any editing before you share them. Raw images capture every bit of detail that your original sensor saw. Therefore, you can change the white balance, edit it, adjust the colors, put in a film effect without losing anything at all. Or if you decide you don't want any of those effects, like a film effect that you might apply to the JPEG, you can do that so you can undo any change. For that reason, I always recommend shooting raw. Even if you decide to use the film simulations, you can configure Lightroom, for example, which is described in my book about Lightroom. You can configure Lightroom to apply those film effects in post, but allow you to ch make that choice in post-processing at your computer rather than at the time of shooting. In other words, it allows you to undo things. So RAW is really easy to turn on. Hit the Q button and then scroll over to the third column, second row. Right now it says fine. I can push the back dial here to switch between normal and then RAW. RAW F takes a fine JPEG picture. Fine is the best quality and a RAW file. So you kind of get the best of both worlds, but it's capturing two pictures at a time. Lightroom would automatically group those two pictures together. So it's not too much extra trouble, but it does use extra storage. Most of the time, I just shoot raw with no JPEG image. Raw files tend to be larger, but as I said, the quality is better. You can slow your camera down. You won't get as many pictures on a card, but at the same time, even if you want to edit your pictures years and years from now, you'll be really glad you shot raw. Now let's talk about using the interval timer on the Fuji. In chapter 10 of Stunning Digital Photography, I describe night photography. And one of the things you can do is use the interval timer to create beautiful, beautiful star trails. Now in that chapter, I'll describe using a remote shutter release with a timer built in, but you don't have to do that because this camera has an interval timer built in. So I'll hit the menu button here and scroll over and down until I get to camera two here. And then right below self timer is interval timer shooting. So I'll scroll to the right here and select this. And now I can select the, how the amount of time that passes in between each picture. So scrolling up here, you can see I'm selecting the number of hours. So you could take a picture every hour if you wanted to do a long term time lapse, for example. Now I'll scroll to the right and select the number of minutes. If you wanted to take a picture every four minutes, that's what you would select. Let's go back down to zero and just take a picture every one second. Scrolling again to the right, I can select the number of pictures that I want to take before it automatically stops. For something like star trails, you'd probably pick 999 and let it take pictures every 30 seconds until you decided to stop the camera. You can always stop it early. I'll have it take just five pictures for the sake of the example. So with that selected, it now prompts me to select how long I want it to wait before it starts taking pictures. I don't want it to wait a number of hours before it starts to take pictures or even minutes. I'll just have it start immediately. So you can see even, even see here, it's telling me that the estimated start time is 617. So I'll click okay here and there it goes. It just took one picture. Now it's waiting another second. Oh, apparently it's waiting a full hour here. <laughs> I must have set it to take pictures every hour, but as you can see, it will automatically take pictures for you until you stop it. You can always stop it early by just turning the camera off. Now let's talk about how to reassign the function buttons. The X-T1 has several different function buttons that you can reassign. There's this button on the front here, this button labeled Wi-Fi on the top, and then these four control dials. 
Each of these can be changed to do something customized. So to customize them, we'll hit the menu button here, turn the camera on, and then hit the menu button. Now we'll scroll to the left and go down to the settings here. On settings 2, we'll go to function FN settings and scroll to the right. Now I can scroll through each of the six different buttons to choose what I want them to do. For example, function 2 is set to Wi-Fi. If I don't use the Wi-Fi, I can scroll right and make this something different. For example, maybe I'd want to set that to the self-timer, which puts the camera on a delay. I'll select that now, and then when I go back to shooting mode by half to pressing the shutter button, I'll press this button, and you can see it brings up the self-timer menu. If I set that to two seconds and take a picture, you can see it's delaying two seconds. There we go. That'd be great if you want to take a selfie with the camera on a tripod. Go ahead and browse through those menu options and assign the buttons tasks that best suit your style of photography. Now let's talk about how to use back button focus. Back button focus decouples autofocus from the shutter button. Therefore, when you have to press the shutter button, it doesn't try to autofocus for you. This is extremely useful in situations where you might want to sometimes focus and other times not focus. For example, if you're doing night photography, it can often be very difficult to focus on a building. So you might use autofocus with the camera off the tripod and get it roughly focused, and then you wouldn't want to try to automatically refocus or it might lose focus. In other words, you would want to have complete control over when the camera focused. Back button focus is also useful for action scenarios where you're switching from a static subject, for example, a person at bat, and you might want to use focus recompose, to a person running down the bases when you would want to use continuous focus. Check chapter four in Stunning Digital Photography for detailed information about why you'd want to use back button focus. The Fuji X-T1 is remarkably simple to set up. It's actually my favorite camera to, to use for back button focus. Just set the focus dial here to manual. And with that set, push the AFL button here whenever you do want to focus. So you can see, with it in manual mode, it won't try to focus when I have to press the shutter button. But all I have to do to activate focusing is to push that. Very easy, no menus to go into. I love that about this Fuji. The Fuji X-T1 is an extremely powerful camera, but it's also kind of quirky. <laughs> Options don't work like they do on other cameras. Not everything is all that intuitive. It's a challenging but rewarding camera. Things like focusing modes work completely differently too, and I hope this video has helped you get the most from your X-T1. Of course, learning the mechanics of the camera is a very small part of photography. Things like composition, lighting, action, planning, posing, expression, these all mean much more to the quality of your pictures, and if you want to learn those, check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography. If you're not into books, don't worry, it has nine hours of video. You can choose to read the book, or watch the videos, or better yet, do both. It also comes with social groups, like a Facebook group, where other people will help to support you. Once you get to the point where you're editing your pictures, which should happen pretty soon, check out my Lightroom book. Lightroom is the best app for editing your pictures, and it does a great job with the X-T1's pictures. even has the ability to use those different film modes that you might be enjoying with your JPEGs while shooting RAW. If you get into the gear, and you want to understand your different lens and flash options, check out my photography buying guide. Besides lenses and flashes, I cover tripods, studio lighting, building a custom computer, and just about everything else hardware-wise you might want to get into. It's a big fat book with a ton of detail for people who love gear. If you have any questions for me, just add a comment down below, and I hope you'll share this with your friends who have Fuji cameras, and give me a like to thank me for it. Please do subscribe to see more free videos. Thanks so much.